Good morning, good evening. Hello, where you sit. I hope you're well. Today is a good big discussion on compost, how to do it all the ins and outs. It's going to be great. Yes. Uh, oh, and this is a medical cannabis program, and it's only related to legal practices and safe organic practices. So I don't promote any illegal activities or any type of that sort of nature. I respect the law and I hope you do too. And this is, um, yeah, the best and safe practices for organic approach. Oh, other ones you can adopt, other techniques you can have. It's, it's cool. This is, I've got quite a few slides here to go through. So, I'll wait for, I'll just wait for a few people to come in because it's, I'll start off in a bit of a pattern. And it takes a bit of a, also YouTube's got a delay. I'll change the background here just for fun. There you go. Yes, it's going to be good today. I've got um, probably, I don't know, a hundred odd slides to go through. And I'm going to really go through the different sections of composting different methods, the microbes involved, the soil organic matter, its constituents of it, its humic substances break down, the material that's in plant materials, because that's what you want to decompose, and it's all of its lignin, hemicellulose, cellulose, all of its different starches and sugars and fats and contents, so it'll go through different percentages of that, and how the microbes actually break it down how they will use oxygen as an electron acceptor and accept oxygen and it starts happening, depends what they're breaking down, different plant materials and stuff like that. Click for more layouts or manage these settings. Okay, I don't want to do that live stream just in case. All right. G'day, so I'll say g'day to Frank. Morning, Frank. And Vin, how you going, Vin? Top of the morning to you. And g'day to Mr. Jeff Papalia. So today is going to be very in detailed compost, soil organic matter, a bit on the cation exchange because that's what it's all basically involved with, the cycling of nutrients. So you want to cycle in nutrients better and that involves the cation and anion exchange. And the humic substances, which are so the end product of all the composting, which is so important. All right, so I suppose I'll get into it now. Um, I was waiting for a few more to rock up because it's, I've got a really good layout of today's one with the way that it's going to flow. So if you could see it from the start, it'd be really good. Uh, all right. I'm just going to get going because there's heaps. I've got probably at least 100 slides to show here. So let's start. So present, share screen. Um, I haven't really, I suppose I should. I'll try and pull up. Oh, that's going to take a few minutes, isn't it? Because I've got so many slides here. I, I'll i open it up and I'll open YouTube up on my tablet and then I can follow the questions because otherwise I'm just going to be in such a big massive rant I'm going to go on for quite some time it's um, going to be hard for me oh. maybe open YouTube on something else while you're doing it <laughs> right just bear with me for 30 seconds I'll try I should just copy the link and do it that way eh? There you go, I'll just do it this other way. Bang. Copy the link that way. Open it up that way. Where is this thing? Nearly done. All right. And that way I can answer all the questions. Or I can at least I'll skim over and I'll look at, because remember there's a 30 second delay. So I can just skim through the, watching the live chat whilst going through the slides and then hopefully I can keep you happy, if you know what I mean. Because at the end, there's gonna be a, a, a fair income, a lot of questions because there's a lot of really good information here. So, 
that's all right. That's going. That's on my chat, ready to go. So now I can share screen, and it all should flow. Edit video, no. Run back to stream out. Jesus, this is technical. Here we go. Getting ready to start. I'm getting ready. Ned Kelly, how you going, Ned Kelly? Getting ready for a good full-on compost session. This is going to be hardcore. Well, it's going to be not hardcore. It's going to be in depth. So, what's compost? So composting is the decomposition of plant remains and other living materials to make an earthly, dark, crumbly substance called compost that is excellent for adding to plants and enriching the soil. And it's the smell is geosmin that you want. What is compost? Compost improves soil texture, structure and aeration and it increases the soil's water holding capacity. So compost loosens clay soils and helps sandy soils retain water, bringing it back to fertility. It improves soil fertility and stimulates healthy root development. Organic matter provides food for microbes and nitrogen, like nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, when it's mineralized. I'm not going to go into the, anyway, composting, the different, there's a few different methods that can be done, and that's about different speeds and about different aerations so the like the indoor method the first two their indoor method and bangalore method they are aerobic and the nadeep is anaerobic so i'm just going to go through the aerobic because they're a bit faster and there's a chances of well it takes it's faster so it's better and depends on what material you're working with really to if you want an anaerobic compost in other words, if you've got a lot of pathogens and bad things and seeds to break down, there's a um, chance you'd probably want to go into the anaerobic just to try and get that temperature up into the thermophilic stage in the 65 degrees Celsius. Once it goes above that, it'll kill all the pathogens and um, the seeds. And then it'll drop out down to the thermophilic stage, no, mesophilic, which is what we want. So the microbes will start reproducing and doing their thing at the range where we want. Uh, the indoor method is a pit. So you'll go and get your materials, your raw materials, which is plant residue, cow dung, weeds, sugar cane leaves, grass, wood ashes, bran. So the things you want to do, your carbon to nitrogen ratio. And I'll go on a little bit about that later on. And the ratio you want is 20, about approximately 25 carbon to one nitrogen. And that stabilizes everything and doesn't mineralize things too fast and doesn't immobilize things too slowly. So first of all, you'd spread, you put out a layer of that in there, and if you'd layer it up, the soil ratio of four is to two is to one with cattle dung with the dry waste, like with his CN ratio, and you don't want it to fill above two feet. If it's above two feet, it generally has a high chance of going anaerobic. So you'll see with all these methods, they don't go above two feet unless you want anaerobic practices to start. Afterwards, sprinkle a bit of water on. Yeah, very good. Um, and then you've got to turn it. Oh, yeah, here's the turning. So first time is 10 to 15 days, and the second one is 15, so it'll be at the 30-day mark, and then the third turning will be at the 60-day mark, and then it should be all ready. The Nadi, well, that's the anaerobic one. I'm not going to go talk about that one. There's way too many slides here to go through. Uh, that's what, yeah, you can put in. That's a recipe for it if you really want to do it. Uh, Farmyard manure is the bulk of it because it's, that's where you get all your microbes from. Other ways of composting are uh, vermicompost, which is worm castings, and it's the end product of the breakdown of the organic material by some species of earthworm. And remember, there's three species of earthworms. Uh, you don't want the anaeic, A-N-I-E-C, because they're the deep ones which eat vermicastings, and that's the stuff that you really want. You want the two top layers, the... Um, Hyper, what's it called? Epigeic, and is the surface layered ones, and the one inside of it is the uh, I don't know. It'll come up later, but you want the right worms, so don't get the anaeic ones. And the species, oh, here's a couple of species for you. So there's the brandling worms or the Asenia foetida, and there's also red wigglers, which are the Lubriscus rubulus. And vermicastings is derived from Latin word meaning vermis. And 
I'm trying to skim through this because there's, a, there's so many different. Oh, I should look at the questions. Okay, I'll just skim back at the questions. Um, I'll, g'day, g'day. Uh, Aussie photos. Here you go, Aussie photos. Gobbly, cannabis, vaporous. Yo, Aussie photos. You should explain how molasses feeds the microbes as well. Um, that was two shows ago when I went heavily in microbes. This is going to be in compost. I might get into that at the end. Um, we'll wait and see. Uh, Aussie sunshine. G'day, sunshine rainbows. Say the Aussie. Here you go, mate. Kelp fraz, sunshine. I do both. But it's much of a top dress if you do compost. Okay. Yep, top dressing is rad. It's a way to administer everything in. Say, uh, Chairs of Chronic. Here you go, mate. Today's a big composting one. I'm going to heavily go into it, so I'm going to skim through all this sort of stuff. So earthworms are the intestines of the earth. That was one of my exam questions. <laughs> uh, organic materials like humus, cattle dung, and kitchen waste are highly attractive to some species of earthworms. Earthworms also emit this ammonium out of their skin, like our liver does. It's really cool. So that's another bonus. It puts a nitrogen source into the substrate. Uh, what do earthworms do? They maintain anaerobic conditions. Aero so aerobic conditions. They ingest solids. They convert a portion of organics into worm biomass and to respiration products. Expel the remaining particular substances to discrete material, i.e. the feces. That's what we're trying to harvest. And worms or aerobic mesophilic microorganism, microorganisms act symbiotically to accelerate and enhance the decomposition. Yes, yeah, so that's why you want to try and get in the mesophilic range, not the thermophilic, because that's our microbes that we want to culture is in that range. So you only want to get it into the thermophilic just to kill all the bad stuff, the seeds and pathogens. Thermocompost properties is very finely structured. It's uniform, stable, and aggregated particles of humic organic material. It's excellent porosity and aeration and water holding capacity. It so is, it's this little dusty, if you dry it out, it's like dust and then you pour water into it, it just doesn't ever want to run out as such. It's water holding capacity is brilliant. It's just like um, dried farmyard, farmyard manure or manure. It's same sort of thing, excellent. Rich in available plant nutrients like hormones, enzymes and benign microbial populations because once it's gone through the worm guts, it's they've um, killed all the pathogens. So that's why it's made them all benign. Oh, mostly pathogen free. There you go. Plant, gosh, plant and human pathogens are killed pr during processing of earthworm guts. It's written there. You don't have to hear it just from me. Earth-like soil building substances that form beneficial growing environments for plants' roots. That's some homemade ways to do it yourself, cheap. See, I notice it's not above two feet. All right, that's it for that one. All right. Oh, I should go back and see if there's any. I'll leave it on that one slide. And that's and now I've got another few more. That was one section. Now yeah, I've got another four sections to go through. Uh, you should explain why this is good. Okay, it's a new going much. Okay, Jezus, no real questions that I can see. Put a question mark if you can, please, and it'll highlight it so I can see that it's a question. Um, hello, I've got good buckets of that. Yep. Okay, next one. So, is this section. So, what's this to do? Bangalore. Oh, that's right. This is some of the methods and the NPK outputs that you might might suggest that you could get from it. And then this is going to vary because it depends what your inputs are. I'll go and I'm going to go through with a lot of inputs that you put in to what sort of outputs you'd expect. So you can train your microbes. You can give them what they want. You can create different environments for them. If you're looking at a very nitrogen pig of a crop coming up, you can maybe try and develop more nitrogen. You can try with 
culturing nitrogen fixing bacteria or enriching nitrogen fixing bacteria in your substrate so by adding the right things you can get the right outputs so that yeah okay it's just a bit of an idea because you can make that you can change it but the Bangalore method def, you know suggests 1.5 is to 1 is to 1.5 so your nitrogen is 1.5 your potassium your phosphorus is 1 and your potassium is 1.5 next the indoor method well it's not it's ready in two months and it's NPK is 0.8 to 0.3 to 1.5 so it's um, a lot more higher in potassium and I've already explained how to do it the combi more is another method that would be an anaerobic method you see how you fill the pots uh, sorry you fill it all right, wide I thought that was deep five centimeters all different processes you can do for getting different outcomes. Farm race residues, see that rock phosphate is an alternative for layers to reach one point. All right, let's get into it more. Boom composting, yep, good. Here are, here's the three types of earthworms. Endogeic, that's the third one I was trying to think of before. So you've got your epigeic, which is ones up the surface, which are in your, a, your O horizon and your A horizon of your soil. And they're the ones that um, you heavily want to get into because they're the ones that are really maintained this heavily composting. Endos do as well. And then the anic don't. They eat the castings. So it's not very good. And they're huge. You'll see them. Big difference. See the different sizes? This one's a giant. And they got make vertical tunnels. And the other two, epigeic and endogeic, they're of a medium size. So if you're... Looking if you're, once the ground gets heavily wet, like if it's saturated, all these tunnels will get filled and the worms don't like it, so they'll come to the surface and then you can get them. So by getting them that way, you don't want to get the anique ones. So be very, very careful. So a good way to do it is to do these compost methods, but leave an open bottom so the worms can come into it themselves and then you'll they'll develop and then they'll start breeding within themselves so you won't have to go and you know find anyone and possibly get the wrong type. Oh, this is a Wikipedia of the geosmin. So geosmin is the smell that you want. So if when you composting or verma castings or anything like that, you can do it even indoors. I've done it indoors for years and it's perfect. If it works, if you've added the right inputs and given it the right conditions. It'll have a terpene called geosmin, and that's the smell of fresh earth. Cut a long story short. Oh, here we go. Worms secrete from their pores ammonia like our kidneys. And that's, so it shows the little nephridopores, nephridiopores in the sides. This is it zoomed in of an earthworm, and you can see the little dots in the side of it. So that's where it comes out. So there's another little bonus from Burma castings. Um, actually, I'll just go back because everyone wants to, has to remember that one's very handy. And I'll see if there's any questions. Cheers, hello, kelp. I do both. Oh, yeah. Oh, good. It's going. Okay. I've got buckets of that. Uh, very good. Buckets, buckets. <laughs> All right. So, going on right. So, um, azos are a good non symbiotic nitrogen fixing bacteria which is works very well in medicinal cannabis yeah azo tobacco and azo spirillium are a few that work really well oh there's azo spirillium down the bottom i was trying to remember it then <laughs> it says it um all right that'll do yeah. uh scanning electron microscopes yeah so if you want to try and see what they're like it's pretty hard because that's sort of got a spherical shape like um, a tic-tac and they're the ones that look like bacillus and pseudomonas under the microscope so it's pretty hard to look under and see that's why you need the scanning and make sure oh look the flagella's there and see the flagella, flagella that's the tail at the back of it and plants genes have about cannabis genes have about thirty-five thousand odd genes in them and depends on your breeding practices, etc. And one of their genes is called an FLG22 gene, and that's to pick up this. It's a flagella gene, and it can tell if the microbe has flagella or not in that gene. That's cool as. 
that was from tissue culture. Here's some other beneficials is phosphate solubilizing microbes, PSMs. So there's species like Bacillus subtilis and some Pseudomonas do it, uh, Trichoderma species. There's some ones that work well with medical cannabis. Um, and fungi, I've got, yeah. And, well, it's not really called the buscular mycorrhizae, it's ecto and endos. Oh, it says it right there. Oh, sorry, I did this course a while ago, so it's hard. Um, but yeah, there's beneficial fungi as well that use uh, what's like rhizophagus irregularis is a good one, which, um, yeah, traps, no, 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 out of this. No, it's one stone compost. There's biopesticides. No, actually, it's the next screen. I'll stop sharing for a sec and get on to the third one after this. So it is going to be time for questions at the end. This is good. Scroll up here, highlight any questions if there is any. Hello, castings. Okay, my plants put half the avocado speed dating for worms. I will have some, okay, right, oh, all right, I'm going to get back to it and into the third section, this is coming along nicely. Third section, no screen, this one. So what are some properties of good compost? So here is good qualities and here is the bad qualities. So the colour, you want it to be nice and dark and high with soil organic matter. Why haven't I gone through the soil organic matter yet? And humic substances. Because then you'll understand the CN ratio a bit better too. Sorry about that. But I'm going to skip this one. So I have to go right back. And I think back here is a. Yeah, there's the humic soil organic matter. There it is. Sweet. See, that's where it's from. It's my uh, soil science and technology course. This is the topic, the slides that we're going to go through. Soil organic matter consists of a complex system of substances ranging from components of organic residues, underlying decomposition, metabolic products of microbes, and products of secondary synthesis and cubic substances. It serves as a soil conditioner, nutrient source, substrate for microbial activity, preserver of environmental major deter determinants for substitutional agricultural products. Global cycle, carbon cycle, it helps with the global carbon cycle. I'm not going to go into that actually, because that's really another thing. Organic decomposition in soils involves the breakdown of large molecules into smaller and simpler components. Plant residues are the principal components undergoing decomposition in the soil. So plant residues are the primary source of the organic matter. And there's two ways it can do it, through aerobic and anaerobic. And you'll, uh, oh, and this is really good. So this is the organic decomposition of, uh, sorry, this is the composition of plant residues. So inside of a plant, it consists of 75% water and 25% dry material. What's that dry material? Well, 45% of it is cellulose, 20% of it is lignin, 18% is hemicellulose, 8% is proteins, 5% is sugar and starches, and 2% is fats and waxes and lipids. Because they're the floaty stuff, they don't dissolve. If you're doing an extraction, you get all that stuff on the top. Um, and then of that, different constituent, the elemental composition of the dry material in the plants, plant material is 42% carbon, 42% oxygen, 8% hydrogen, and 8% is ash. So remember plants' nutrient requirements, it's 95% of them come from the atmosphere with your carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, making it 45% carbon, 45% oxygen, and 5% hydrogen that all come from the atmosphere for the plant's nutritional requirements. So that's a pretty good chart, that. just tells you exactly what you're in your breaking down of your compost and that type of stuff. 
So the rates of composition changes too. So it's not only just with temperature, it's to do with the constituents, materials that it is. Because the, uh, like the outsides of the, the different cells composition, like the scaring climber cells, they're called, or the column climber cells, they're the outside that's bark, made of bark. And that's got different cell wall thicknesses in it, so it breaks down differently. Same with like the fats and waxes, that will have different oils in it, so that will break down differently too. And as you'll see here on the right hand side, it shows the different speeds. So up the top is rapid. So the sugars and starches and simple proteins that can be readily uptaken and processed chemically by microbes, <clears throat> that gets broken down real fast. And then it goes slowly down through the hemicellulose, cellulose, fats and waxes to the lignin and phenolic compounds. So they're all like the alcoholic compounds and the terpenes and all that sort of stuff. That's why you'll see them floating on the top. And they're very slow to decomposition to decompose. That's cool to the light on. And this is how it happens. So with microbes. So you've got your carbon and hydrogen containing compounds, and then you add a little bit of oxygen in it because we're doing anaerobic composition here. And then it'll start forming the enzymes, and then the enzymes will start breaking down further. So if it was a nitrogen um, component, it might produce nitrogenase and then that will start breaking down the nitrogen and release it to the atmosphere so then it, the oxygen will release as carbon dioxide and then well if it was nitrogen it might form one of the nitrogen molecules and then it's broken down into energy as a result for the microbe to use that's how the decomposition process works uh, i'll just read some see if there's anything from the chat F1, no, they're into <clears throat> talking internally. Good on these guys. I like us. I like the nice community of this. You'll get no drama here because it's only to do with plants and soil and microbes. So um, I'm appreciative for everybody to keep that tone as well. Good on yous. Everything will stay nice and happy. Well, I'll try and keep it that way anyway. Back to it. Um, I'm not going to talk about decomposition of anaerobic soils or breakdown of it it uses different chemicals as you can see here you're into your archaea it's a different form of microbe and it produces all your, your methane methane is oh gee whiz it's 30 times worse than carbon dioxide in the atmosphere for the greenhouse gases even though we've just about fixed the greenhouse gas effect the whole the ozone layer <laughs> Actually, I can only forget saying that. So factors controlling the rate of decomposition. So here's where it comes into the carbon to nitrogen ratio because that's a humongous effect because if you've got too much carbon, brown, and not enough the green, that means you're not going to have much nitrogen source. So microbes, their main element that they require after the CH and O usually is nitrogen so if there's no nitrogen things are going to be very slow and the more nitrogen the faster it's going to be and that means that the minerals that you're trying to break down they won't be immobilized meaning that it's going to be uh, held up in another molecule for instance nitrogen might be sewn up in nitrite which means it's got to go through a, another formation to make it into nitrate NO3 for the plant so things it's important to get that ratio right too I'll talk a bit about the different ratios CN ratio stuff a bit later um, other factors is majorly the temperature if you've got it low temperature if you're down near freezing it just it'll halt everything all biology stops so you want it in the mesophilic range like a room temperature and above ideally like it's you want it up around the the 80s Fahrenheit, you know, around the 30 Fahrenheit, 30 Celsius, and then it's going to start and really, really thrive. And then the availability of nitrogen, yeah, is very important. Soil ecology and the quality. So what's, yeah, has it got much lignin and phenol, phenolic compounds? And if it does, remember from that chart previous, down here, it's going to be very slow to decomposition, to decompose. So you don't want, um, you have to make sure the quality is there the right things 
So the quality of organic matter, it sort of just, just goes on about the different charts of the CN ratios. Having, I'm not going to explain it, it just goes similar to that. All right, this is how soil organic matter forms. So to do with microbes. So it starts with the plant litter and after fire happens, it'll turn into biochar or a lot of potassium rich elements that's char and that's homes also for microbes because the little plants and sticks and things they just make little air pockets inside of them once they get up to that temperature and it's good form for that um, the microbial biomass on so upper right it produces enzymes and then the co2 is released to the atmosphere and the npk and the elements are dissolved and when these compounds are met metabolized by microbes to obtain energy, most of their carbon is released in the atmosphere. Yep. And the, the upper left, the, hang on, no, I'm just trying to read here just to give you some better information instead of me out of my mouth. It's the cell tissue and microbial cell walls become inaccessible to microbes, break them down. Oh. So enzymes need, with plant litter, make the energy. So the metabolism equals the catabolism, which makes energy, and anabolism, which uses the energy up. So from the enzymes, that makes the energy. This energy is in dissolved into the carbon and other materials, and the exchange has happened with all the different molecules around. As it's broken down further by microbes and with more enzymes, you get into a humic substances and that's protected by absorption to mineral substances. It's also inaccessible inside microalgae propagates, micro, microalgae algates. So the micro, so bacteria will put out a biofilm around it and that will make an aggregate with the um, soil compounds and forming a, an aggregate or a pod, a soil molecule. And then that in that biofilm will be antibiotics to stop other microbes getting into it so it can proliferate and it'll also help with clumping up of the soil uh, that'll do for that page this is a good one so this is uh, different pools of soil organic matter so it shows the fast turnover or the slow turnover so the slow turnover is the humus and the fast turnover is all of the living organism biomass the dead tissues of different cells, the free bits of particularly degraded tissue, the free or dissolved biomolecules, the nitrogen enriched products or things that are green, green manure, that turns over fast. <clears throat> and slow stuff, yeah, the humic substances to break down the walls, cell walls, and char. Uh, this is a little bit on the exchange of the nutrients, of the cation exchange and anion exchange. <clears throat> it's called the iron exchange, IEC. So once this you form your soil organic matter, what it does on the right hand side here, it has all its different molecules. So the OH is the I wrote this down was the hyd hydroxide. Hydroxide is OH. And the CWOH is the carboxyl. And so once it's made, it's just sitting there ready to act up. And it's got its negative charge sitting on it because of its uh, electrically way that it's gotten there through the redox breakdown. And bang, all these cations come along, the potassium, magnesium, calcium, sodium, they will just cling on, chink, and then it's locked in. And then that forms its position there and that's how it gets enriched. So that's how the soil organic matter can enrich your substrate. Humus is a complex and resistant mixture of brown or dark brown, amorphous and colloidal organic substance that results from microbial decomposition and synthesis and a chemical and physical properties of great significance in the soils for plants. It's so, so beneficial. Uh, it's great for foliar too. I just um, put a little bit in with the foliar, put uh, 
a one part cumic to two or three parts kelp with reverse osmosis water and 100 ppm dilution. The humic groups substances have aromatic rings. No, I'm not going to go that heavily into it. There's three main humic substances. There's humic acid, fulvic acid, and humin, H-U-M-I-N. Out of those, the humic acid is the fraction of the substance, the humic substance that's not soluble in water under acidic conditions under 2 pH. So don't worry about that. Um, that was one of my exam questions, actually. The, the exam question was, I'll tell you again. They can be extracted from the soil. Humic acids can be extracted from the soil by various reagents and which is insoluble to dilute acid. Uh, humic acids are dark brown to black in color. Fulvic acids are yellow to light yellow in color. And they're the fraction that is water soluble under all pHs. And the humin, H-U-M-I-N, is the fraction of humic substances that is not soluble in any pH value at all. And it's alkaline. So humin's black in color. So that means it's not soluble. So if you put organic matter or humic substances into some water, the humin will float. Otherwise, it's not soluble in water at all. Below, um, I don't really want to touch into the molecular weights of the stuff and that. No. So here's on the left is a bit of a colour chart. Munsell's colour chart. Uh, Munsell's colour chart actually is the way to tell the soil organic matter to, to give your, uh, sorry, not the soil organic matter, but to read your substrate to tell you what's going on. So it's a colour chart and it's more the colour chart that you can look and visually see what's going on. So you can, um, yeah, don't have to do any chemical tests. You can just do a visual. Morphogenic, it's really cool. Um, so your fulvic acid's light to yellow, then the humic acid's dark brown to grey black, and the humin is black. And they increase in the colour and degree, in, in, increase in degree of polymerization from the left to the right, it increases in molecular weight substantially. That's why the molecules go very dark to very light. Uh, the compound, the carbon content increases from 45 to fulvic to 62 in human percent. The oxygen decreases from your fulvic acid, which is 48% oxygen, to the human, which has only got 30% in it. That's very low because remember the, uh, anyway, back to it, the decrease in exchangeable acidity, uh, no, decrease in degree of solubility. Yes, so it's more soluble. As we already went through. So humic acids, what's this in the right here? Humic acids of peaty, sandy, hydro, earthy soil. And the humic acids of a haplic and acids. So you can see the different acids in different conditions. So they're it's good there in the peat soil, sand. They're clumpy in the acidic soil because the different, the humic substances, probably the shower, the humic acid would have dissolved because it would have been under 2 pH, so it's dissolved. And then, oh, that one would have been the, under 2 pH because see, that's, everything's dissolved, so it's a lot worse. So that would have been above 2 pH if this was to be in a normal <laughs> photo. And the separation of fumic substances, um, no, actually, I'm not going to learn about that one. Fumic formation theories, no. The influence of organic matter in the soil. So it's just, it makes such a massive, massive difference as we're sort of leading to the soil organic matter. You want it to be at least, what, three or 4%, and then you're gonna get this exchange happening with all the elements that is beneficial for the plant. You can, and the microbes are gonna like it. So if you just use the clay, which can do a similar thing, because it's with its isomorphic substitution, it can exchange the elements as well, but it's not gonna be interactive for microbes because clay works different. It doesn't need microbe interaction. And the microbes keep on going and keep breeding by budding fission. You know, they can just multiply. Remember how the, what was it, 4,000 times the surface of the earth can be covered in 48 hours if the right microbes given the right conditions. Remember that from a few weeks ago? I was remembering as a 1,000, but it's, we said 4,000. So back to this, influences of organic matter. 
It's dark, which facilitates soil warming. Albedo is low, with, because remember, your albedo is your reflectivity. So with white, it's high, it reflects, black, it absorbs. It improves the physical condition of the soil as well. Better nutrients, better clay to humic com complexes, which buffers the exchange capacity, like I just sort of went on about. The organic matter can form stable complexes with some metals and influence their availability to plants. Yes, so it can bond onto them, the organic matter, and hold it and chelate it. So that means it's unavailable and locked out to the plants. So there's a big bonus if you're growing in some pretty particularly poor areas because, uh, remember, it's a bioaccumulant, the cannabis plant, so it will pretty much suck up whatever is around it and hold that in different vacuoles and dermal tissue and other etioblasts and plastids that are inside of the plant. The biodegradation of different chemicals like pesticides through the interaction with organic matter is an important phenomenon in relation to human and animal health. It's how to measure soil organic matter. Um, yeah, in the lab, stuff like that. Um, we haven't got access to that. You want to go just from your eyes. There's a good, this works basically through photospectrometry. Oh, like right here. So you can see the sample comes in, it just ignites it, and it goes through a gas chromometer, and then it gives a detector and a spectral reading, which gives you your output. So you can use your eyes too for soil organic matter and just to see how dark it is. And it's not when it's wet, because remember when it's wet, it's going to go darker. So you want it when it's medium. You don't want it to be drenched. Because you'll, you'll wet it and you think, wow, look how dark my substrate is. It's so good. But yeah, wait till it dries out a smidge, and that gives you more of an indication. Uh, we can Soil testing is another cool. Anyway, management of soil organic matter. Conservation tillage is a must if you're growing outdoors. Cover crops. So you should always put cover crops or mulch on. If numerous... Of, Done a whole lecture on just mulch, it's rad. Crop rotation, uh, crop residues, nutrient management, organic amendments is very important. Yes, if you want to, you have to keep on top of it. You can't just let it do its thing. You got to every different growth phase, there's eight different growth phases in cannabis. You want to make sure you're on top of each phase and the humates. Soil and climate change. Uh, uh, no, that's just into into the breakdown of it. Soil's organisms. This is, I suppose, to do, actually, is there another thing we can come back to? Because this is on the microbes. Yeah, now let's go to this one. Oh, actually, I better go back and just see um, see the chat for a bit, see if there's anything coming in. Um, uh, so, yeah. Blinky, how you going, Blinky? Hope you're doing well, mate. My family member, put a, a question mark, if you can, please, next to it to uh, get any questions out there because it's hard for me to see if you don't mind. Five to ten grams. Nexus, how you Nexus? Resin, GP, dynamic lifter, everyone. Dynamic lifter is lime, and you want to use lime if you're trying to raise the pH from your acidifying soil. Um... This part's grown mace, g'day brother, who's a gun mace? Happy buds, vaping fan. That's the way, mate. Uh, thank you, no questions. Uh, good morning. G'day, Sunshine. Oh, there's a question. What is this liquid magic resin? So Sunshine, I don't know what you're talking about. Have a zoom. All right, I'll get back to it. So the properties of good quality compost. So good quality is black to brown. And the yeah, pores vary. The smell, you want a nice, earthy, geosmin smell. Remember, geosmin? And a bad odor, the nose knows. If you're getting some funk action, you're breeding some anaerobic pathogens, more than likely. And I've done that in the past. And I thought, what's this odd looking, just an odd tweak of the nose? And then, yet, yeah, bang, there comes out some umycetes or some pythium and fusarium and those ones that are so unhealthy for cannabis roots. And the pH you want a good quality compost is about 6.5 to 8, and any side out of that is wrong. And the carbon to nitrogen ratio you want about as a 25 is to 1. Uh, it depends if you want to make it faster or slower, but anything outside of that, uh, out of the 20, 20 to 1 or 30 to 1 bracket, is going to cause problems. 10 is a bit low. 
maybe after it's finished, but not in the process of composting. Actually, this says compost too. Okay, so this is a after product. This is an ING, okay? Temperature, yep, so one in the mesophilic range, 30 to 45 Celsius or 80 to uh, 110 F. Above that's thermophilic, which is going to kill everything, and you don't want that. You want it in that composting, but not for compost. Moisture of just finished compost is 25 to 30%. When it's composting, it's 60 to 80%, very wet. You want to pick it up and squeeze, and there should be some drops coming out of it. That maintains all the microbes are going to be very stoked. Uh, humic substances, well, it's hard to tell that, but good quality compost has above 4% humic substances and has a nitrogen ratio above one percent that's high so that means you'd want to try and capture that in so there's different ways that you can try and retain your nitrogen because you're not excuse me nitrogen easily accepts electric and uh, <laughs> electron donor oxygen which can change it and break it down earthworm ecology all right, this is just those three species before a bit of a one of my teachers for this organic farming course was um, a earthworm biologist, so she went heavily into earthworms. It was good though. Epigeic. Epi means top, geic means earth. So that's the ones you want. Epigeic. And there's a few different other types they see here. That was that brandling worm they said at the start, that is Senia foetida. And here's the Peraonyx excavacus. There's another one. The red brown, the red, no, it's not a red brown. One. And then the endogeic, endo means inside, and geic's earth again. And that's living inside of the earth always. It doesn't come out onto the top very often. And then the anyic is a subsur subsurface one, the massive big ones, brown, lives in deep vertical burrows feeds on litter and castings on the surface see that not very good mate because we want to try and farm the earth cast the worm castings now here's a bit on the carbon and nitrogen ratio so if you've got into your compost heap that you're trying to build it up and want to manipulate it you can you can add more brown which is your carbon source to slow things up or you can add more nitrogen source, which is your greener things, and that will break it down. Because remember the nitrogen, the chlorophyll pigment is a magnesium atom in the center with nitrogen tails going off it. So there's a there's heaps and heaps of nitrogen in the green chlorophyll pigment stuff. So um an under ratio an under CN ratio would be mostly suitable for high nitrogen content. Under CN ratio, oh, if it was high nitrogen, or a 19 to 27, which is a pretty good, so moderately suitable, and moderately suitable, it's 85 or anything, okay. Water hyacinths, hyacinths is a, uh, the worms, that's a fancy name for them. Uh, sawdust, yes. Is not suitable at not less, but it's not suitable. Fair income. If you want things to break down slow, it's got a sawdust is a 400 to 1 carbon nitrogen ratio, so it's very, very slow. So you can, yeah. And remember, if you're adding things, you want to get a good source of non antibiotics and things like that into it because the antibiotics kills microbes. That's what you're trying to get everything to break down. So if you're using animal manures, you have to source it from that non antibiotics very very important and all right that'll do for this page uh here's how to make a bed thermocasting bed i've got a pretty good video on this on how to commercially do it too if you've got a farm you can commercially do it make your own like see how these are all made there's a commercial farm homemade everything so you've only got ex export exports from your, your farm profit so you use all your manure and your green manure and then you'll just turn it into rich, broken down, microbe rich plant available material that you can sell. Look at this multi-tiers, homemade. It's fascinating. I love how they can, the ingenuity. From these studies that I do in India, they show me the 
traditional ways that you can do stuff and then they'll show you the USA North America ways where you can pay top dollar and get all this plastic in and uh, bad for the environment or you can do this um, very environmentally friendly way but look at that it's all made out of compost material itself all the plant materials it's cool ways I love it more about saving the earth it's only you know it's so hard to pollute but so so easy to pollute but so hard to look after it sustainable agriculture is the word worm no uh moisture oh yeah here's this said before remember the compost when you're making it 60 to 80 percent this is actually vermic castings but it's, it's a similar thing because it's to do with microbes temperature yep is 20 to 35 c so what's temperature is 20 is about what's that 70 to 85 Earthworm separation. I oh, know this is getting into that advantage of organic farming. No, why enriched vermicastings? Yeah, this is another way to. If you're struggling and different, if you've got a cultivar that is very favourable in nitrogen, for instance, um, you can enrich your vermicastings, and that will give organic inputs to the plant when it needs it it'll only ask for it at a certain time through its exudates and then it'll get broken down through the organic acids that it wants and then it'll get taken up so that you can do it that way instead of bottle feeding please don't bottle feed nitrogen enrichment strategies for natural sources so these are different ways if you want to get for instance the same before how to get a nitrogen output if you've got a nitrogen pig of a cultivar that you're doing you can use mustard cakes, all the different cakes. So cakes are just the extraction of, say, neem cake. You'd be putting neem seeds into a and getting the azadirachtin out of them, and then it has 5.2% nitrogen left in it. So out of that, you can – that's immobilised nitrogen, it's called. So to mineralise it, it's got to be broken down. So that's when you can put it into your compost and get the microbes to turn it into the minerals. And there's other ways of getting phosphorus by – Rock phosphate has a high amount of phosphate in it, but it's got to be broken down by your chemolithotrophic bacteria. Your chemo members chemical, lithotroph means rocks. Um, so that's the types of microbes that you want to harbour to get the best out of your rock phosphate, your rock solubilising, your uh, phosphorus solubilising bacteria can also aid in that. Bone meal, so bones is really, really high in, but it takes a while to break down again. Hoof and hoof meal, horn and hoof meal. So other types of substances. Basically, this is getting back to DNA. DNA holds heaps of phosphorus. That's the backbone of it. So these things harbour all the DNA. So it's your DNA stuff. Um, potassium, if you want that, that's a lot of your ashy things. So after things has been broken down or burnt, it's charred up. Or just get some sylvite, which is 63%. Wow, we, yeah humongous and calcium magnesium is different branches of this or gypsum is uh i don't know no i'm not going to say something wrong because i don't want to say the wrong thing so i'm just going to get on to the next one there are different ways if you want to enrich your outputs you can put these inputs in there might be even some more of a preparation no i'm not going to go into that uh effects of organic different ways of microbial inoculants uh, no not really this is how to get the output of it no this i did a whole video on this on how to make to enrich your cultures and make microbes work for yourself because you get look, potassium solu solubilizing bacteria phosphorus solubilizing bacteria uh, there's nitrogen releasing, nitrogen fixing bacteria, trichoderma, are a, can't remember, CL, don't know. All right, next, next, actually I'll stop sharing for a bit because I think this, let's do it one more go. Yes, I do. One more component. So I'll just see what's up here, see if there's anything cool going on. Oh, good, moving for now. Okay. I'll scroll up and see. I'll just catch up for a bit. Is this magic? Good, there it is. Have a look at that. Uh, Blinky, take care. Love the new. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, does it do PP? No, that's not a question for me. Um, okay. Very good. Just internal chats. Good on these people. So I like everybody chatting and getting on well. I'll get back to sharing the last little bit on the on this detailed compost discussion. Now, and it's going to be this one. So for components of the sustainable agriculture, you really want to make your own inputs. You don't want to bottle feed or do anything like that. If anything, I will admit I might bottle feed some, uh, some foliars. Like, just to be accurate, I might do it that way. But I'm talking like very extremely low, PP, 100 ppms, and that's just to reduce or eliminate deficiencies because I don't like to bottle feed anything. I like it to be organics. So that's the only time. So, it's, yeah, you can quote me later on. Yeah, he does do it. Yeah, it's foliar at very minute amounts. But you really want to sustainable agriculture have farmyard inputs. So from um, that's if you're growing outdoors conservation tillage. That means you don't you do between zero and uh, 0 0.1, with one percent and nine percent of the earth has to be tilled up and all residues are left on the surface. That's what that means. Green manuring is all your green manures. You know everything leaves, anything basically green that's healthy-ish that I've gone through that's gone back in that can go back in agroforestry or your stems everything trees things that break down slower your lignin that sort of thing intercropping crop rotation manuring farmyard manure is one of the major sources of all these because that's where you get all your microbes from because remember microbes they look dormant they put their endospore inside of their body of their prokaryotic cells the first half is their living bits with all the organelles their cell organelles and then the second half is their endospore so that means when they go dormant they die out all that sort of thing there's once they get into the right conditions they can recharge and restart back up again and if they're loving the conditions they will just reproduce through budding fishing choo, 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 choo. so the manure is a magical source of all of that so it's get your antibiotic non source non-antibiotic manure and uh well you can use a slurry to put on top make it as a paste I know it sounds bad, but that's a good way to seal it because all of your the oxygen reacts with nitrogen and it's very fastly changes the ammonium from NH4 into NH3, and that's ammonia, which is the gas. So it'll get volatile and get released back to the environment into the, the you know, the it'll be airborne. So to lock that in, you'll make it slurry out of manure, and that's a good way to seal it in like you're putting it like slurry over the top and paste it in. So there's a bit of a hard surface. So it'll help with nitrogen. Um, classification of manures. So there's bulky manures, organic manures, and there's concentrated manures. So the concentrated ones are the ones that have been broken down, like the cakes, the blood meal, meat meal, and others. And they're into edible and edible. The bulky organic ones mainly derive from animal, plant, and other organic wastes and green plant tissues. So remember too, when you get your green plant tissue, you want all your leaves to have minimal dots on them and minimal uh, eatages and problems and things like that. So if you're getting one with heaps of problems in it, it might be paid to get it you want the temperature to be up to in the thermophilic range of 30, 65 celsius at least which is what 160 fahrenheit and be there for i think it's two or three days at least to break all the seeds and pathogens down and you get probes and put them into your if you've got an area like that if that's the only source that you can get you can make rag compost out of it but you just have to do these practices to get a good output uh you and farmyard manures is excellent. It's just really good. As it, just, it's microbes, source of microbes. Grant clean tissue. Okay. Very good. Next one. Bulky organic manures are those materials of plant or animal origin, which when added to the soil in a large and bulky amount tend to decrease the density and increase the soil volume. 
So you want, oh, I'll read it the rest, thus providing better physical conditions for plant growth, especially in coarse textured soils and also provide essential nutrients in smaller quantities and chemicals. So they reduce the bulk density, so the compaction in the soil, and that makes better roots, aeration. It allows the carbon dioxide to be cycled better, all the gases that are involved down there, microbes, and everything just works a lot better. It reduces anaerobic conditions. Uh, characteristics of bulk. Organic materials are relatively poor in concentration of plant nutrients. So the concentrate characteristics of bulky organic manures are organic materials are poorly relatively in concentration of plant nutrients. These materials possess a wider CN ratio and a carbon sulfur ratio and supply energy needed for microbes. The mineral nutrients in the organic materials become available to plants after it's mineralized. A judicious combination of organic manures is essential to maintain fertility status. Just like farmyard manure, compost, green, yard, green manures, biogas slurry, sewage or sludge, molasses and vermicompost. So you just want a lot of inputs. Molasses is a terrific input because it's a starter for molecular activities because they'll all need some sort of energy source and this molasses can be easily broken down and given them energy. So then they only need a couple of other things, electrons, to get their microbial process broken down. So that's how molasses really helps speed things up. Farmyard manure. Uh, well, you just put hay on the ground, like over in here in this diagram, and the urine soaks into it and the dung as well and scrape it out, fastest way. Farmyard manure, on the average, it's well decomposed. It contains 0.5% nitrogen, 0.2% P2O5, which is the available form of uh, phosphorus, and 0.5% of potassium. So it's really, really good. If you get more urine in it, you might get a higher percent of the nitrogen and the potassium. Uh, how to make it we've sort of gone into making it with farming up in Europe the next morning you're on site yep good potentially forms rotten <laughs> vegetables okay I'm just skimming through this compost is a product that, okay here's some more composting methods this is a course that was written last year 2022 and this explains a few more methods uh, there's 10 methods here on the screen. I like the indoor method, I-N-D-O-R-E, because it's very short and it only maintains three times you have to turn it. Other ones are different. Another good composting I also use is vermicompost, which is worms. It's awesome. So between the two, yeah, you just can't go wrong. Combi more. Okay, this goes into a little bit more methods of how to do it. I've just kind of covered a couple of ways that I like. These are some ways, yes, how to do it. Hopefully there's some better stuff coming up here. We've got compost advantages. So the volume, I'll just pause on that and see if there's anything. Because we're getting into the last little section here. Uh, I'll just go up a bit and see what's going on. Uh, yeah, I think no substrate. Uh, so no really questions in brilliance. CF. Diamonds. Monsanto. Something. Not important. Uh, all right, everything's good. Compost advantages are the volume reductions of waste. <laughs> the final weight of compost is so much very less because of the different chemical processes have been gone down and it's volatilized back to the earth and all those chemical gases have been released. Composting temperature kills pathogens if it's above 65 in the thermophilic range Celsius or about 160 odd F. It kills pathogens, weed seeds and seeds. Matured compost comes into equilibrium with soil, having a terrific everything. It's, you can call it healthy as soil. 
during composting, number of wastes from several sources are blended together. It's an excellent soil conditioner. It's a saleable product. Um, it improves manure handling, so you don't have to deal with all the yucky manure things and possibility of any catching stuff. Reduces pollution, pathogen reduction. It's composting is just everything. <laughs> but oh, and some more advantages. There's is some disadvantages though. But some, uh, some more advantages are it suppresses plant disease and pests. It reduces or eliminates the need for chemical fertilizers. It promotes high yields of agricultural crops, facilitates reforestation and helps with other unhealthy soils. It costly, cost effectively remediates soils it removes solids, oils, grease, heavy metals, and other contaminants. That's, this is what compost does. It sucks it up. Remember, it can become chelated, and it can lock it in and make it unavailable to the plant. So the organic matter and in the compost is so beneficial if you've got any problematic areas. It captures and destroys up to 99.6% of industrial volatile organic compounds in the air. So if there's any problems in the air too, it also arrests them. It provides cost savings for at least 50% of conventional soil, water and air pollution remedial comp technologies. It's brilliant. But there is some disadvantages because in compost, because the compost is heavy and it's bulky and it makes it expensive to transport. It's so much easier just to transport some nutrients in a bottle and then they just add water and sell that to people. But the, another disadvantage of compost is the nutrient value of compost is low compared with that of chemical fertilisers. So the rate of nutrient release is slow so that it cannot usually meet the requirements of the crop in a short time because they get some nutrient deficiencies. So that's where you can do some foliar diff, um, restorations and that easily affects it or you can just do some top dress amendments or you can just do some pre-amendments pre with some slow release products that are organic that are mineral um, immobilized so that they will mineralize and when the plant needs it so there's a few ways you can overcome this that last one and the last one is the last disadvantage of compost is the nutrient composition of compost is highly variable compared to chemical fertilizers meaning your inputs will give you your outputs. So if you're only putting not very good stuff in, you, that's the output you're going to get. But if you're going to diversity, mix it up, give a big microbial population in there, a lot of different manures, healthy manures, a lot of different green, you should do pretty good. Some more disadvantages are agriculture of compost. Agricultural users have concerns regarding potential levels of heavy metals that contaminate the compost. So that's, yeah, that's, again, depends on the inputs. If you're putting bad inputs in, you're going to get bad outputs. So long-term and heavy application of compost in agricultural soils have found to result in salt, nutrient and heavy metal accumulation and may adversely affect plant growth, soil organisms, water quality and animal and human health. So to overcome that is when you'll mix in your organic material, different inputs, You'll have your different microbes that will break things down and different sources of manure that will have all these different microbes to remediate the conditions that were put in there in the first place. So green manuring can be defined as the growth of a crop for a specific purpose of incorporating into the soil while green or soon after mature improve the soil benefits of the subsequent crops. Plowing or turning of under decomposed green plant tissues into soil can improve the soil's physical condition and fertility. Make sure with the green stuff, if you're going to do that, you want to bury it deep so that the ammonia isn't the ammonium isn't turned to ammonia when it's been met with oxygen and released back into the atmosphere. You want that to be contained in the soil or in your, your substrate. The objectives of green manuring. Uh, well, I'm not going to say then, they're pretty obvious. You want green manuring is just healthy. Green manuring in situation, it means that their crops are grown, buried in the same field, and 
either as a pure crop or as an intercrop. The most common green crops are sun hemp, densha, uh, pilbesca, and guava. Okay, green leaf manuring, green leaf manuring refers to the green leaves only, not all the stems and not all the high coals and all that sort of stuff. Green manure crop. See, see, that's just going to be used. That's grown out of season to be used only to help the fertility and organic matter that's in the soil because this farmer's thought, thought ahead and they know that they want a good, uh, easy, plant-rich, plant-available nutrients for the next season that's coming up. So they've gone ahead and thought this. So then they'll just probably let them die off or they might go and put hay over the top and lock all that green in. They might do a conservation tillage where they might just turn the roots upside down and leave everything right there. Green leaf manure crops. Yeah. As a direct, that's the neem tree. Because neem's high, it's 5% nitrogen, so it's really good. Also, as a direct, and is the, a good constituent and neurotoxin for pathogens. Nutrient content of green manures. Here's some of the, the three we mentioned before, the sun hemp, the danger, and their nutrient, the NPK ratio. So they're quite high. So you've got a, a two is to one is to two ratio nearly of all of them. So if you can get the right inputs, you'll, you're in a win-win situation. A lot of these things here, you'll go out and you'll buy amendments, like a uh, neem cake is, I think it's a five is to three is to two or something along those lines. So that's actually, you're paying money for something that you can get straight out of a plant, grown, making the ground fertile at the same time. So the biomass production and nitrogen accumulation of green mature, green mature crops. So as they age, they will change their material that's inside of them. So here's a bit of a list here of after 60 days, the dry material, tons per hectare, and then the accumulation of the nitrogen in kilograms per hectare. So they do vary a bit, like the Cespana Aculita, it has 133 per ton per hectare, 133 kilos per hectare of nitrogen that's accumulated just in that, in its green leaves. And then you'll go down to the cowpea, which is a bit lower, which is also very beneficial because cowpea is a legume. And that has not only in the green leaves, it has 74 kilos per hectare. It will also have in the roots uh, nitrogen fixing bacteria, which are, uh, what type are they? Uh, be, anyway, um, it'll have those in the root nodules. So you'll get a bit of a, a bonus later on as well. Concentrated organic manures must have higher nutrient content than bulky organic manures. The important concentrated organic manures like oil cake, blood meal, fish meal, etc., also known as organic nitrogen fertilizers. They use these crops by converting the back through bacterial action into ready mode, ready usable ammoniacable nitrogen and nitrate nitrogen. Remember, they're the only two forms that the plant accepts out of the seven or nine types of nitrogen that there are. And these organic fertilizers are therefore relatively slow acting, but they supply available nitrogen for a more extended period. So it was the way of getting the best out of your organics by using this system with the nitrogen. After the oil is extracted from oil seeds, the remaining solid portion is dried as a cake, which can be used as manure. The oil cakes are of two different types. You have your non-edible ones, and then you have your edible ones. So your non-edible ones will be the ones that, like neem, that means livestock can't eat, and then the ones that the edible ones, like groundnut cake, coconut cake, ones that can be eaten. And you use them in, in a few different ways. You've got to be careful with your non-edible ones if you have livestock around, that's for sure. And that's what they'll look like after they've been dried, they've, all the stuff's been pushed out of them and they've been dried. And this is the nutrient content of your oil cakes. So you see they do vary a lot, but in general, they're quite high. Like you're getting your fours to five in your nitrogen with your solid twos in your, remember the P205 is your available form, there's two forms of available potassium, uh, phosphorus, 
that you want. And we, our main one is the P24, oh God, no, I'm not going to cry it. P24, P24, no, it's the ortho primary and ortho secondary. Oh, come on, P24, no. <laughs> and the uh, potassium range is quite high too, it's got a two. So you're looking at a, what, four or five, it's a two, it's a two. Just from these using cakes that have been squeezed from their goodness. And the other concentrated organic manures, can't forget them, like blood meal. When, that, when that's dried and powdered, it can be used as manure. The meat of the dead animals can also be curded into meat meal, which is a good nitrogen source. But yeah, yes. You can have your hoof and hoof horn meal, raw bone meal. Average nutrient content of animal based concentrates organic manures. So you're these are very high because they're concentrates. So you might use them in different circumstances um, and bury them at different levels for a, for a lease. Um, yeah, you can see them. I'm not going to read them all out. But your different blood meal, meat meal, fish meal, herd and bone meals, they've all got, they're higher in your nitrogen, higher in potassium. Especially look at the DNA, rich bone meals. Soil beneficial microbes as a link to sustainable agriculture. Yes, you must have beneficials. Well, it's all to do with microbes because they cycle everything. They'll reproduce when they need. They'll give the plants roots when they need if they're in the favorable conditions. And so you've got to keep them happy. This is what this whole discussion is really on. Buy fertilizer. No, not getting that's a whole nother discussion. Massive discussion. There's just so many of them. All right, I think that's it. Yay. That was it. Where is the back to not, sh not sharing? Oh, yes. So now I'll take questions. I haven't seen any questions come through, but if there's any questions, please feel free to drop them down. Um, and that little money button underneath, that's for the support button. So I appreciate the, the people that have done it. It's very helpful. And I just appreciate it because I'm not really making any money. So um, thank you guys and girls for helping. And uh, if you do want to subscribe, there's a membership there and it's $5 or 8 bucks, depends where you are, just for support. So thank you for that. And then it's $80 for the lectures that I haven't released. They have cool kept them private. It's about a dozen. Then the $100 ones for a one-off call if you're having problems or setting some area up and I've got a gift that I made and then the $300 one is for like a business or someone who's going through ongoing problems maybe with a med medical doctor or their cannabis dispensaries or something like that where I can give my educated opinion on so I'll tell your friends <laughs> um, right I'm back to reading this Stony Creek here you go Jeff got that idea. Okay, watching that. Scooting. Okay. What? All right. Um, good on, Farmer. How you going? Good hey, Nice to see you, my How is you? I can highlight people. So, how are you? Gonna watch. Um, no real. What's that one down there? Turkeys. Oh, Stony Creek. <laughs> there you go, Stony Creek. No, no, right. No real picks. No real questions for composting. Really. I could go on. There's another one. I've been talking for a bit. I reckon. I've got another paper on understanding the role of humic acid in crop performances and soil health. That sort of touches a bit more into detail. This is a, a very long paper. Uh, sort of gets into why humic substances are good, what they do, how they break down, how they chemically alter things to get benefits out of them, how they exchange their protons. And yep, biggest plan. Um, so does anybody have any um, questions on composting today? At all? I hope everybody can start composting. To do it, you just get a bucket, put
put it outside or even a large pot, put it outside so the worms can get in through the bottom of the pot. Start putting your vegetables and scraps into it and the biology will start and increase and multiply inside of it. That will attract the little arthropods and macroarthropods, microarthropods, and then the soil filled web will start and establish itself. The earthworms will come in and start and really turn things up after that. And then before you know it, you've got a compost heap started and all you did was just put some food scraps into a bucket, into a, sorry, a pot with holes in the bottom and make sure that those holes can, you know, even dig it down an inch or, you know, two or three centimetres into the soil so it's underneath so the worms can get into it easily accessible. And that's it. Then you started your compost heap and then once you get enriched with worms, and then they are happy, they'll start multiplying, and then you've got your vermicastings, which will be easy to break it down again. And then you'll get your addition of your ammonia from your earthworms getting secreted out through the pores. So everybody can do it, and then they should, and start throwing less into the bins for the wheelie, for the rubbish man to pick up, try and recycle it and give it back to the plants for sustainability. And what else can I say? So everybody eats, so I hope that everybody can do that. And it's, it's just effort. That's the thing. A lot of people haven't got time and stuff like that these days, but it's um, it's worth a lot valuable. You know, if I'm a connoisseur of cannabis, so I really put an extra effort into the microbes and what the other external actions that happen in the plant so I can get a good result from the plant and bring out the genetic potential. And I don't mind doing that because I know it works really, really well. It's up to everybody's what the standards are and how you are. But remember too, if you've got internal space and you think, oh, I just live in a flat, I can't do anything. Well, you can. You can get a maybe a filing cabinet, those big metal filing cabinets that are cheap, two or three doors, drawers, put a tote or a plastic container in the bottom of them that fits and put up one hole in one of them, put it on the angle and then put a catch bucket underneath. Start throwing your scraps in there. And before you know it, you should get good smelling geosmin terpenes coming out of it. And then you know everything's right, keeping the moisture level at right with the scraps and building up. And then, yeah, you'll notice after a few months, wow, everything's it's dropped half its size. I put in a whole bucket full and now it's half its size. Well, if you turn that upside down, you'd see all these little round balls and everything's broken down in, and enriched. And that's your concentrate that you want to harvest. So I hope it's hope everybody can get into it a bit more. Um, there's a few manure sacks. There's still no questions, eh? I'm just trying to rattle on a bit and tell this stuff, just waiting for some questions to come through because I thought there'd be a lot of questions. But Bunnings has made these. Everybody's just made things too easy now just to go out and buy stuff. And I promote the old school way just to get good results. The... Big man doesn't like it because marketing's gone. You're not supporting big stores or other people working. You're just supporting you and getting back to breaking down the products that you eat. My my outputs are very low because of my I recycle my inputs. You know, I recycle my outputs that should be outputs. I try and recycle them. Even your cardboard, you can give back to the earth. You can put that down as solarization of weeds. So just put that put it down if you've got weeds. I put a lay a big sheet of cardboard and put some dirt over the top. Bang, goes the weeds. And if it's in the sun, it'll be, yeah, hopefully it'll get up to the right temperature. If not, you can use black plastic to get up to the right temperature and kill your weeds off. And then you've recycled and it kept your microbes alive. You haven't killed them by putting hot water or DDT or anything bad on them. Uh, right. Well, I appreciate everybody talking internally. That's good. But this is... Um, not much that I, I don't want to bore you by repeating things. So uh, I think I've just about there. This first week with no questions. Looks like everybody knows the compost stuff. <laughs> oh, all right, that's good to know. I hope everybody is. Um, right, eh? Well, I'm going to wrap it up and I hope everybody's going to have a good week. I'll be back in seven days time. I've got no topic for next week. So please bring your questions and we can talk about 
other things related to medical cannabis. And I can show some more, share some more slides and enlightened topics. So I hope everybody has a really good week. And I can see is mushroom compost. What was the question? What about mushroom compost? Yes, mushroom compost. Wow, that was really mace, mace. You just got in there, mate. Um, I can go into here. Mushroom compost. Let me highlight comment the question there. Mushroom compost is high in fungal dominance. It's very high. The you want a good level of bacteria to fungal ratio in your substrate, and bacteria really help with a lot of bacteria can eat fungi too as a uh, energy source sometimes but you want a good dominance actually there's a chart that i can show you about that while you bring that up is um it's a ph thing actually where is this chart? i'll do one more slide share because i love this chart yeah show my computer uh flame where is it here we go. It took me ages to try and get this chart. I've done researching and everything and all sorts to just to try and find it. Oh, is it there? It's not there. Oh, where was it? She should be there. No. Oh, file upload. Hang on, I think I'm doing the wrong thing here. I'm just going to go and look for it first because it's it's it's, it's really snazzy. I'm stuck with it. Soil science, no, it's not in that one. It's in, it's just to show the relationship of the bacterial and fung fungus at different pHs. There it is. I found it. Now, this took me ages to get. So, and it's sort of related to what that question is. Tie screen, I'll do because I don't know where it is. There it is. So this is to, related to the different pHs that fungi and bacteria are in. So see how once you get below about 5 pH, bacteria really are selective. So you've got to be careful about that. But with fungi, it goes all the way down. So they don't really... Oh! Sorry, there's a, a big... Oh! Organics is happening. Oh, I can't really say that. The crows are getting into something outside. What a feral place. Soil, back to what was I saying? Oh, bloody lost to me now. That's, um, anyway, I like this chart. It's a soil pH related to your NPKs and your CalMag sulfurs um, and related to bacteria and fungi too. Just shows you different. Oh, <laughs> I don't But yeah, mushroom compost is rad but don't expect too much bacterial substrate because it'll be fungal dominant with its different beneficials. But it's still compost and it's still excellent. So it's, yeah, a great source of substrate. But I would put in, I would mix my mushroom compost with organic compost if I would have to put something as a substrate selector. I use 20% organic compost, 20% worm castings, 10% farmyard manure or manure from an organic, uh, sorry, from a non-antibiotic input and 50% perlite as a substrate. You can choose your own. There's many different ways to grow and it depends on how you want to do it. Good question, mate. All right, so I'll just skim down to see if there's any more. Thanks, Jeff Papaya, for your support. Uh, mushroom compost is excellent for mycelium. Yep, mycelium is the hyphae, multiple hyphaes. So a hyphae is one individual sort of line sticking up, where mycelium is a group of hyphae that lay dom. They, they're the white furry stuff that if you pull the sub soils or substrates up, you'll see them underneath looking like an old man's beard underneath the surface. And when it reaches its right temperature, that's when the, the mycelium will fruit and then it'll form the mushrooms. And usually the right temperature is four to 14 Celsius. Uh, cruising down, Aussie photos, yeah. 
of this thing. John 420, g'day mate, here you are. Thank you for joining us right at the end here. Today was a good compost in details. So I'm just looking for questions, otherwise it's just about over, I think. Who's going to, uh, I'm going tomorrow, yeah, good. You got roadkill in your backyard, CC. Yeah, mate, there's, um, it's not roadkill, it's a rat. It's massive. The crows are on the fence outside just eating it because this place, it, anyway. Um, oh, <laughs> it's just holding it. <laughs> if only I could show you. Oh, yeah, Jeff, it's funny, mate. Good on them. It's biology working its best. Nice, sunshine. Very good. <laughs> All right. Please bring your topic, your questions for next week because I will have an open topic question on medical cannabis. Wouldn't have a clue what it is. Or I'll start just sharing the stuff that I want. But again, we'll be trying to, I'll be trying to get out the good word on medical cannabis and how to bring out the genetic potential in your plant and do it the safest way and the least, less toxic way and the best way for the environment and the best way for your hip pocket. So sorry, everybody else who doesn't like that, but that's what I promote. And the legal ways as well, I've got to add that in because I promote legal activities. So thank you to everybody who's came in today and had good conversation and I hope you really enjoyed today's show because I've spent a little bit of effort into it. <laughs> uh, yeah, all right, well, if you'd like support, you're welcome to share some support down the bottom with the money or the like button or I can just wait till next week and see you again. So thank you everybody for turning up. Have a good one, says Dave, 1969, and you too, Dave. And everybody else, I hope you have a good one, and I'll see you all next week. So happy breeding, happy growing, and good health to you all. Thank you. Good night. Good evening. Goodbye. Thanks, mate.